AQA, A-level physics, astrophysics, video number nine is about supernovae, uh, neutron stars, and black holes. And I'll be covering this bit of the specification. I'm gonna leave out the dark energy thing till a later video. Um, also, I'll talk more about standard candles later in another video, but everything else I'm gonna cover. So, very large stars. Now, very large as in bigger than 10 solar masses. Uh, what happens when they die? I do suggest you have a look at uh, my GCSE video uh, on uh, the life cycle of large stars, okay? On, uh, on my other channel, one of my other channels. Um, but anyway, a bit of revision there. So, very large star, and if it's bigger than 10 solar masses, then it will collapse very quickly and there will be a supernova explosion. Uh, what you are left with uh, depends on the mass of the core that's left. If the mass of the core left is less than three solar masses, you get a neutron star. If it's bigger than three solar masses, you get a black hole. Okay, so what's this supernova? Well, supernova occur when a very large star collapses due to its own gravity. Normally during its lifetime, uh, there's, there's forces pushing outwards, which are due to fusion, yeah, the nuclear reactions happening in the star, and you've got gravity pulling inwards. Now, when a star is in the main sequence, these two forces are balanced, okay? For most of its life, the force of gravity and radiation pressure, we call it, are balanced. So the star is balanced. However, near the end of its life, uh, the gravity becomes the bigger force. When fusion starts fizzling out, gravity gets bigger. And in the case of a very large star, it collapses very, very quickly. And it becomes incredibly hot, very small, very hot, and you get this chain reaction, a fusion chain reaction, like a thermonuclear bomb. And that is your supernova. So when a very large star collapses, it gets very, very hot, runaway fusion, chain reaction, explosion, supernova. And that is what a supernova is. Uh, a very famous supernova happened in 1054 which is um, a while ago, like uh, nearly a thousand years ago. Uh, and basically it appears as a very bright star in the sky, uh, perhaps one that you can see during the day that there wasn't a star there before. But then over the course of a couple of weeks, the star fades away. And now that we have telescopes, if you look where it used to be, you would see uh, a nebula, okay? Um, like this is the Crab Nebula, uh, and that's where this supernova that was seen in 1054 was uh, observed. This is a light curve. Now, a light curve is a graph of apparent magnitude against time. And you should be able to recognize this. You should be able to sketch it. And notice that basically from nowhere, you get a very, very bright object up to a magnitude of zero, but then it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And then after several weeks, it, it's faded away and perhaps it's not even visible to the naked eye anymore. However, when the supernova occurs, you're talking like how much power does it give off? How much energy does it give off? Uh, remember about 600 billion times more powerful than the sun. So lots and lots of energy, very, very bright flash. And we also get uh, for a few hours, uh, lots of gamma rays as well. This is another way that we can detect supernovae is with gamma ray telescopes. And this gamma ray burst may last for a couple of hours. If the mass of the remaining core is less than 1.44 solar masses, uh, then we get a white dwarf, okay? 
our sun, when it finishes off, it's not going to go supernova. Uh, it'll take a, a bit longer to kind of fade away. But our sun will end up as a white dwarf. If the mass of the remaining core is less than three solar masses, so bigger than 1.44, less than three, then we get a neutron star. If the mass of the remaining core is greater than three solar masses, then we get a black hole. OK, so it depends on the mass of the core that you're left with. So um, with a white dwarf, basically, there's not enough gravity to squeeze electrons together. So we end up with basically a, a very, very hot white star. Uh, but it is very, very dense, but nowhere near as dense as a neutron star. Um, with a neutron star, there is enough uh, gravity to squeeze the electrons together. This is called electron degeneracy pressure. You don't need to know. But there's not enough gravity to squeeze neutrons together, which is your neutron degeneracy pressure. Uh, if the mass is big enough, however, then total collapse. Electrons, neutrons, everything squish together into a point singularity of infinite density. This is what a black hole is. It's not a, a black blob. It's a point singularity. OK, it's a tiny, 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 well, infinitesimally small speck, which theoretically has infinite mass. That's what a black hole is. Because its gravity is so strong, matter has collapsed. It has been squished together. Let's talk a bit about neutron stars. Now, neutron stars, typical radius about 10 kilometers. Remember, it used to be a very, very big star, you know, much bigger than our sun. And it's been squished down to about 10 kilometers. Uh, typical mass is about 1.4 masses of the sun, solar masses, and it is composed entirely of neutrons. It's like the same density as the nucleus of an atom, but it's made almost entirely of neutrons. Um, if you want to get a few extra marks, it has a very, very hot surface, very, very strong magnetic fields, and they rotate uh, several hundred times a second. So they're whizzing around very fast. OK, um, find if you if you're interested, look on my astronomy site if you want to know what pulsars and things are. I don't want to put too much in these videos that you don't need to know, but they are very interesting neutron stars. Look up the mass of our sun. Uh, use the data I've given on the left to calculate the density of a neutron star. Typical exam question. What would the mass of this little one centimeter cube be if it were made of the same material? So pause the video, have a go at that, and you should get something like that. The numbers obviously might be slightly different depending on the, the radius that you're given in the exam. Now, black holes. If the mass of the core is greater than three solar masses, then we get a black hole, a point of infinite density. They have actually managed a couple of years ago to take a, a, a photograph, a, an image of a black hole uh, using like uh, several telescopes joined together. And these telescopes were on opposite sides of the Earth and they've managed to take a picture of a black hole. Amazing. This artist's impression is off the film Interstellar. What's actually happening? Why do you get this weird bit in the middle? And it's the light from behind the black hole, which is being bent by gravity so that we can see it in front of the black hole. But the black hole itself is just a tiny, tiny little speck in the middle. Um, there is a, a point around a black hole, a certain radius that nothing can escape. At distances less than the Schwarzschild radius, the gravity is str so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. Okay, uh, and this sphere 
the surface of the sphere surrounding the black hole is called the event horizon. And the event horizon is at the Schwarzschild radius. At less than the Schwarzschild radius, nothing can escape the black hole. Okay. You might be thinking, well, uh, light doesn't have mass, but this is kind of a Newtonian way of thinking about it. If we think about space time and uh, masses warping space time, it's a, it's a kind of a more Einstein way of looking at things. You know, light is affected by gravity, even though it doesn't have mass, it does have momentum though. Now, for an object to escape, um, this is, first of all, I derive an expression for the escape velocity. Now, I looked up earlier on, and I did a video on it earlier on, and it doesn't actually ask you to derive the expression for escape velocity, but you should know what it is. So uh, I put, well, kinetic energy goes to GPE, so a half mv squared goes to little m gm over r. So there's the velocity, there's the escape velocity, and there's an expression for the radius, just rearranging it. Therefore, the Schwarzschild radius is about 2 gm over c squared. That's an expression for the Schwarzschild radius. I don't think it would be too much hassle to learn that little derivation there. So uh, imagine you have a black hole that has five solar masses. Uh, work out its Schwarzschild radius. Okay, look up the mass of the sun, look up big G, uh, and you should get 14.8 kilometers. A little bit more about black holes. There are lots of smaller black holes in every galaxy. I mean, lots and lots of big stars have died. And when they died, they ended up as neutron stars and black holes. So basically, within our galaxy, there are lots of black holes, lots and lots of them. Black holes can collide, they can join together. Okay. Um, and there is believed to be at the center of our galaxy and lots and lots of other galaxies, a super massive black hole, uh, which is maybe millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. With, there's evidence for this supermassive black hole. If you look at the center of our galaxy, now look at this animation. These are some of the stars around the center of our galaxy, and they appear to be gravitationally influenced by something very, very massive at the center of the galaxy. That's an amazing animation based on real data. So at the center of certainly spiral galaxies, there's believed to be a supermassive, a huge, huge black hole. And then the whole galaxy rotates around it. Now, a type 1a supernova. What's a, what causes it? Well, you have a binary system. It's interesting, by the way, if you look at all of the stars in the sky, go out tonight, if it's a nice clear night, you see lots of stars in the sky. Most of them are binaries. Yeah, you can't tell unless you actually look with a powerful telescope. Most stars are binary stars. Now, this is a binary system which has perhaps a, a very large star like a red giant uh, and a white dwarf. And what happens is they rotate around each other and the white dwarf sucks in material from the red giant. And this material uh, is absorbed by, it goes into the accretion disk first of all, and then it's absorbed by the white dwarf, which gets more and more massive. And when its mass reaches a certain value called the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, you get a supernova. <sighs> So when the mass reaches a certain value, a definite value, you get a supernova. And the flash of the supernova, we know its absolute magnitude because it's the same for all type 1a supernovae. So this means it's very, very useful. If you know the absolute magnitude of the explosion and you measure the apparent magnitude, you can work out how far away it is. Uh, and we call this a standard candle. 
I'll talk a bit more about standard candles when we do cosmology uh, in a video or two. OK, so it's very, very useful for calculating distance. If one of these happens in a, in a galaxy that you're looking at, and if you measure the magnitude of the flash, you can work out how far away the galaxy is. It's called a standard candle. 